switch the screens over here. Doug, thank you for that introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here and uh, thrilled to see all of you here too. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this technology we developed, um, which we think is a really compelling alternative to conventional bioplastics. Um, but I also wanna spark your minds a little bit in new ways of thinking about how you can actually use nature to create replacements for conventional disposables. But I do, let's go here. Um, so everyone is, who's here knows what the problem is, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but you know, I, that's okay, thank you. Uh, I do wanna highlight kind of you know, where, where are the issues with plastic. You could recycle it, which, which is good, but generally it ends up in, in a couple of places. One is in landfills. Uh, two, it lands on the ground, which means it gets into a waterway or a water stream, which is, which is bad. And then the worst case scenario is when it actually gets into our environment, it does start to break down. But it doesn't break down in a sense of a conventional biological material, which can be a nutrient for other organisms. It breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces that lodge themselves in birds, fish, animals, and even your bodies. Um, and really the issue with these materials is they're, they're fundamentally uncompatible with our planet, right? They're just clogging up the Earth's metabolism. So at Ecovative, we see our goal is eliminating disposable plastics. Plastics are actually pretty amazing. I think there are some good uses for plastics, but it's in single-use applications where they get disaggregated. They end up at a lot of different consumers, and you're faced with the task of trying to collect them, trying to recycle them, that they really don't make any sense. Um, so one way to solve this is to make plastics that fit into our natural ecosystem, right? Just like a leaf on a tree is a highly complex composition of polymers and other cool biological machines that turn photons into, into leaf. Um, but when it falls on the forest floor, it's not a waste product, it's a nutrient. Um, people have been trying to make bioplastics. But the challenge with these is, is cost, performance, and sustainability. And it's very hard to get all three. Some of the best biopolymers that have been created um, actually don't perform as well and typically are not 10 or 20% more expensive. Okay, thank you. Uh, but actually it could be three or four times the cost. And this is a big issue because, as Doug said, these materials are really building up in our oceans, on the land, and in our bodies. And we can't have 10% adoption. We need to really drive a fast adoption curve. And to do that, to get conventional industry to accept these technologies, you have to check all these boxes. And at Ecovative, we've, we've realized that really the only way to do this um, is to cheat. You have to get out of your conventional mindset. You do. Uh, you can't, you, 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 have to, you have to look at the problem through another lens. And um, at Ecovative, we do this through something we call, I'm just gonna use this here, bioadaption. And bioadaption is, is kind of like biomimicry, but unlike in biomimicry where you, you'd look to nature and say, boy, the, the, the bumps on a dolphin's fin really help it make fast turns in the water. So I'm gonna design a submarine with bumps on it so that it makes fast, efficient turns. That's biomimicry as we think of it. Bioadaption is actually going out into nature and saying, wow, there's all this incredible technology out here, all these incredible living systems. We're gonna adopt one to solve a conventional industrial problem. And I'll tell you just in a second how we've done that using mycelium, which is the root structure of a mushroom as a biopolymer. So rather than extracting something from an organism, we use its entire body as the polymer. Um, but first I just wanna, I wanna stretch your mind a little bit in thinking about how amazing nature is and this bioadaption question. And to do that, I want to tell you about something that's called the eggomatic. Uh, this was invented by a group of uh, Stanford students who were doing market research, and they, they realized two things. Keurig machines, these little coffee cup machines you get, which uh, make coffee one single cup at a time, very popular. They're going like gangbusters. People are buying lots of these. Two, there's a big movement around local food. People want to have the freshest, localest, closest food. So they did this NBA thing, and they put it together and said, we're going to create a new home appliance, the eggomatic. It's gonna have these features. It's gonna create one fresh egg per day, and it's gonna use very little electricity. And now, imagine how cool this would be, actually. You go in your kitchen in the morning, you put your little uh, egg cured cup in here, it's got half starch, half water. You put it in the top, you're a little sleepy, like I was this morning, it, it goes in, the eggomatic vibrates, and out pops a fresh egg, right? Now, if you were to try and actually design this using conventional industrial technology, the way we make plastics, this would be a billion dollar process. If you were to try and use synthetic biology to somehow engineer E. coli to make all the components of an egg in your kitchen, it would still be a billion dollar process. But the point is, you could make an eggomatic today, 
for about ten dollars. So you guys know what's in the box? That's right, it's a chicken. It's just a chicken in a box. And we forget how amazing chickens are. Literally, a chicken takes starch and water and converts it into an egg. And it makes one a day. And it doesn't use any electricity, right? So this is, living systems are amazing. They, they, they knock the socks off what we can do with conventional industrial technology. Um, so Arthur C. Clarke says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I would argue that a chicken is actually sufficiently advanced technology and is pretty damn magical. So, so why am I telling you about this, um, putting chickens in boxes? Well, part of it is, is actually recognizing the, the uncommon beauty and the common things around you. You don't think about chickens being amazing egg converters because you've grown up seeing them since you were very small, right? We, we just take them for granted and we take a lot of our ecosystem for granted and forget just how incredible the services it's providing are. Okay, let's, let's get back to mycelium. So at Ecovative, we're using mycelium actually as a glue. Um, you would use uh, a conventional plastic resin like styrene to make a foam. Uh, and at Ecovative, we've used this to create something we call Ecocradle, eco which is a, a low-cost alternative to styrofoam. And we do this by growing these mycelial cells through low-cost agricultural waste products and binding them into a composite. And it's a true bioadaption story. We're not extracting anything from the organism. We're feeding it a low-value feedstock. And we're taking a living system like the chicken from nature and putting it in a new lens. And this is actually a serious product. Uh, Dell uses it to ship their servers. Puma's using it to ship surfboards all around the world, including to Brazil. Um, and we actually just partnered uh, with the Sealed Air Corporation, which is the biggest US packaging company, to build plants across North America uh, and hopefully Europe. So me, all right, yeah. So, so let me give you a little more details on, on how this actually functions. Um, we start with a feedstock. Conventional bioprocesses start with a high value feedstock, like a starch or a sugar. We use a low grade feedstock, something like a corn stover, um, the, the byproduct of uh, sh sugar cane production. We can even use a rice hull or a buckwheat hull. So these are the things that are actually thrown away from conventional agriculture. We then deposit the material into a mold and add these mushroom cells to it. It's kind of like making bread. And then over about three or four days, the mushroom cells actually grow around this material. They use the feedstock as the nutrient, but what they can't digest becomes embedded in the final product, producing a composite. So we're one of the few factories in the planet that not only takes a waste stream in, but uses 100% of it to create a new product. And this is actually a lot how natural systems work. So, Briefly, we'll start with a different regional feedstock. Our goal is actually to have formulations all around the world. So if you're in Brazil, you're using bagasse. If you're in upstate New York, you're using buckwheat hulls. You don't want to transport these materials a lot. Um, I'm going to share this video. Uh, this, is, this is now two years old. So uh, you'll see how our plant looked when we were really trying to figure this out. There's, there's a lot of duct tape and old food equipment. We, we've just built another state-of-the-art plant. Um, but we have a really simple process. I like to think of it as low-tech biotech. Those are the cotton waste products there. They get conveyed into a cooker, which sort of moistens the material. They run along this line. The material is deposited into these forms, which give it the shape. You'll notice we're using plastic, but we're using it in a re reusable, controlled fashion. So these tools get used hundreds and hundreds of times in our factory. And it's actually when this tool is filled with the ag waste, the mushroom cells have just been added, and it leaves this clean room that our manufacturing process really begins. Because these parts sit on shelves for two or three days, and it's the mushroom cells that are doing the work, growing around these particles, actually binding them together. And in the end, you get, in this case, a corner block, which looks, works, and functions just as well as a conventional styrene packaging part. So I keep saying we grow these, we grow these, we grow these. I want to just give you a little sense of what this looks like. So this is a time lapse. We took five days of growth, condensed into, two, into about 30 seconds. And if you watch these little white dots, these are the mycelial tissue bits. And you'll see they actually start to expand and extrude throughout this in a 3D matrix. And just like a biological system, it's an exponential growth curve. So it starts slowly and finishes strong. And that's how we actually adhere and grow our materials together. In this example, growing a corner block for steel case. So this is really turning industrial 
processes on their heads. We're building giant indoor farms to grow cost-competitive alternatives to regular plastics. And we're doing it not by trying to match the properties of a conventional polymer, make it make the same chemical composition and then run it through the same extruders. We're actually having to reinvent from the ground up how an industrial ecosystem will work. And I think this sort of approach is crucial if we're actually going to move the needle and get people to switch away from conventional polymers. And we've talked a lot about disposable plastics, but at Ecovative we're actually adopting this platform to things like building construction. Uh, we're designing a flip-flop with Puma right now, since those tend to end up on beaches. And we're even working on auto parts. This here is a uh, insulation for the Ford Mustang race car. Um, but there's a lot of other things in the world that are made out of plastics. In fact, plastics, as you said, Doug, were the future in the 60s. It's become the predominant platform that people design in. And at Ecovative, we realize we are not going to be able to hit the nail on the head for every application. And our goal is not necessarily to make the most money, but to have the most impact. So what we've created most recently is something we're calling the Grow It Yourself Kit. And this is a way that people can take this platform into their own homes or businesses and actually design in this platform just like you would design with a conventional polymer. But unlike a conventional polymer where you'd have to add heat and pressure and an expensive mold, you can do this on your kitchen counter or in your design laboratory. You can get this material from us, you can add water, and actually make your own product, material, or service. So just, just as an example here, um, oops. Um, this is a, we did a, a beta of these last month. Uh, we sent these out to about 100 people around the world. Um, this designer decided to make a, ch a small chair. He wants to build a bigger chair, but he started small. He took these particles, we sent them, he added water. This is this ag waste material. And the fantastic thing is all you have to do is put it in a mold, let it sit for about five days, and it actually grows into the shape you want. And our hope is that just like people be started designing in plastics 40 or 50 years ago, people will use this platform to design in mushrooms and create a whole range of materials, whether it's disposable plastics like for packaging or doorstops or whatever else you're seeing in your life that is made out of plastic but probably should be made out of mushrooms. <laughs> so that's all I have on Ecovative. Um, looks like we're about 10 in. I have another... Uh, bioadaption story I can tell, and then maybe we can uh, take some questions. Um, so one of the things I've learned, in, uh, or I was, I was forced to accept in starting Incubative from one of my mentors is you have to demand more. So he helped us set our value proposition at Incubative to not make a, a, a greener alternative to plastic. He said to me, Eben, you have to make it cheaper, you have to make it better, and you have to make it greener. That's the only way it's going to be successful. And it's scary to set those demands, but it turns out when you're inventing or innovating or changing a system, it's pretty much it's hard to do it no matter what you set your criteria to be. So you might as well set high expectations. And while I'm thrilled that we're here focused on, focusing on disposable plastics, and that's what I'm spending all my time on right now, because I really think it's one of the biggest issues we need to solve, I think we actually need to be thinking ahead and demanding more. Because a lot of the things we use around us are just as toxic to the environment but they haven't yet hit that threshold in the global consciousness or the ecological consciousness of damage. And I'm talking about actually a lot of the equipment I'm using right now. This LCD screen, this computer, the phones in your pockets, they're used out of, use expensive rare earth minerals, they've got lead, they've got cadmium. And when these materials need to be recycled, it's incredibly complex to separate all the pieces out and bring them back to their constituent states. So the e-waste problem is gonna be, in my opinion, just as big as the plastics waste problem in the coming future. So 